Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Andrew Green. You just have to remember the colour on election day. Uh, last time I was in this hall was only a few weeks ago, actually, uh, when your constable kindly invited me to join in the celebration to acknowledge 20 years of sheltered housing in the parish. And together with your residents, we had, a, I think, a, a splendid afternoon. I proudly represented St Helia for, uh, as deputy for two terms, and I believe that I have delivered both as a minister and as a backbencher. Time doesn't allow me to list all the achievements, but if I had to pick one, it would be the housing transformation programme, transforming homes, transforming lives. I have a vast experience in managing and leading change, and my plan for housing was described by independent experts as honest and courageous. I spent most of this afternoon walking around your parish, knocking on doors and talking to residents. Homes for the elderly, population and the development of the hospital were subjects of the day. And this evening, I've decided in the time remaining that I would concentrate on health. First of all, by advising you that uh, if elected senator, I would like to be the next health minister. I would use my experience in directing change and 40 years senior management experience in the health service, both here and in the UK. Not that we wish to follow the UK. I would use that experience to help me with my job. We are to build a new hospital. As to whether this should be on two sites, I think needs to be reviewed, and I would review this and report back within 100 days. However, what I'd really like to talk about tonight is not the buildings, but what sort of service we as islanders would like to have. It's time for change. The current model, as in the UK, is unsustainable. You know, in Canterbury, New Zealand, they've already acknowledged this. And the report issued by King's Fund stated very clearly that by 2020, if they carried on with the model that we have, Canterbury would not only need an additional hospital, but another 2,000 care beds. It was judged by the city as simply unaffordable. I believe we're in the same position and we need to do things differently. This process has started, but it takes vision, it takes courage and honesty to sustain it. Change within the hospital must be done with the staff at every level, not to them. We need an integrated health service which will keep people in their homes, in the community that they know, with the correct level of support. And schemes such as Jersey Post and parish com community schemes uh, will be essential to this. The so-called ageing population will be both a challenge and an opportunity, an opportunity to use the experience of our older folk and a challenge to ensure inclusion, not exclusion. So if you want a person, a new senator, with courage, vision, thinks independently, works collectively with a track record of getting things done, please vote for me. Go Green 14. Andrew, thank you. Zoe Cameron. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. The World Wildlife Organization published a report yesterday announcing that the population of vertebrate species had dropped 52% in the last 40 years. The human population, however, continues to rise. Last week, world leaders met at the UN to discuss how they would address climate change into the future. What's Jersey doing? We're actively improving home insulation and car fuel efficiency is improving. But are we protecting the countryside enough to ensure that the carbon dioxide we produce can be resorbed? My husband and I recently looked into becoming energy self-sufficient. We would have made the investment in geothermal, solar or wind technology to enable us to generate our own electricity. We asked Jersey Electricity to help, but having made a site visit, they were largely negative about that possibility. Yet in countries like Germany, 25% of energy is now produced in this way. When I visited the floating straw islands in Lake Titicaca during the Hospice Cycle Challenge in 2005, these islanders had their own solar-powered electricity. Reading reports from the United Nations and the states of Jersey, renewable energy sources and technology is becoming affordable. We are in an ideal location for harnessing tidal power. China is investing heavily in renewables. I know St Lawrence is concerned about the environment and we're one of the first parishes to encourage recycling and I hope we're able to develop safer cycle routes. As a keen cyclist myself, I know one do needs a great deal of courage to get on your bike in Jersey. 
Countries like New Zealand that, like us, have introduced compulsory cycle helmet laws found that unfortunately this led to reduction in health. It is an unintended consequence of suggesting that cycling is hazardous, meaning that less children and adults take it up. This leads to more car journeys, road traffic accidents and less exercise taken. Countries with the safer cycling are those that are, where it has become a normal way to travel, such as the Netherlands and Denmark. London has seen an increase in life expectancy because of the introduction of Boris bikes. It now takes one and a half planets to regenerate what we currently consume every year. This is not sustainable. I believe that these are important issues that KPMG and the like have not taken into account when they predict a doubling of the elderly population in 20 years. The question we should perhaps be asking ourselves is, are we doing enough for the generations coming after us, for them to care about what happens to us if we do survive into our 70s and 80s? As a fellow parishioner who isn't afraid to address these issues, I hope you'll vote for Dr Zoe Cameron on the 15th of October. Thank you. Thank you, Zoe. I call Alan McLean. Thank you, Madam Conantarb. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, good evening. I'm extremely proud to have had the opportunity to serve my island and our community on many important local issues as well as on the international stage. I've worked hard together with colleagues to build Jersey's reputation abroad, developing trade links and securing inward investment to support the economy and jobs. I was first elected deputy in 2005. I was re-elected as senator in 2008 and elected Minister for Economic Development at the beginning of a period covering the most severe global financial crisis imaginable. To meet the challenges of the last few years, I've overseen the transformation of the Economic Development Department, reducing headcount to um, finding new ways to support the economy more effectively. We set up Digital Jersey to promote and develop the digital sector. We set up Jersey Business to support small and medium-sized businesses. We developed Locate Jersey to drive inward investment, which is so critical to diversifying the economy. We established the £5 million Innovation Fund to address the shortage of funding for business. We introduced the Foundations Law to boost financial services, modernised crucial intellectual property laws, introduced a financial services ombudsman to protect consumers. So to any doom and gloom merchants, I say, the economy is improving, unemployment is falling, and confidence is rising. But don't take my word for it. Figures released just today on the performance of the Jersey economy in 2013 show that for the first time in six years, the economy is stable. Traditional sectors like agriculture and hospitality grew by 12% and 2% respectively. But there are still threats and there is still much to do. So I've instigated a review to identify and remove unnecessary red tape, regulation and legislation that's a barrier to investment, growth and jobs creation. I want to develop and implement a creative industry strategy. I want to see skills and training programmes developed and importantly aligned to industry needs to ensure that more locals can uh, seek the specialist jobs. That's how we reduce immigration pressures. I want to see options reviewed for business incentives and tax breaks to make Jersey more competitive and to stimulate investment and growth. I want the income support system renewed to ensure fairness and value. I want a disability strategy developed. I want to see modernisation of the public sector accelerated to ensure more efficient and co cost-effective public services. I want to see the cost of government controlled rather than a soft option of tax tax rises. I want to see uh, the reduction and control of the use of consultants in the states. In conclusion, ladies and gentlemen, I believe I have the proven leadership qualities, track record and experience to help build a strong and sustainable future for our island and our whole community. Thank you. Thank you, Alan. I call David Richardson. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. You will find a lot of people tonight talk about the budget deficit, about the fact Jersey needs to control its spending, about the 7,000 workers in the public service that need cutting back, 
but the department such as health that needs accountability and efficiency. Of course I believe in all these, but I believe that Jersey is a little bit too introspective. I work in the finance industry, and I think we should be able to make savings by being more proactive with our neighbour in Guernsey. I believe there should be interstate online debates. There should be find ways of finding savings, in such as law creation and law drafting. Then we could have more dialogue about savings in education, health and major capital projects and share expertise in many areas. I believe we should not only promote Jersey but the Channel Islands as a whole as vibrant, robust centres of excellence and, and forward centres and safe centres for financial investment. I believe we should work more as one voice. In previous hustings, we've been asked what sort of ministerial post we'd like to be in if we were elected. I think I would choose population. Population is the elephant in the room. We may not be able to control population, but we have developed methods of restraining it and pointing it in certain directions. I'll give you an example of immigration. In the last few hustings, we've been education's also come into a bashing. If we are to improve our education, which we want to have the best in the world, we will have to import, as we do at the moment, science teachers and maths teachers, because we haven't got them here. I believe we should create subsidised accommodation for those essential employees, whilst offering them termination bursts, bonus inducements to leave at the end of their contracts. In that way, we would ensure healthy turnover of people without adding to the overall population size. We should do the same in other sectors, such as nursing and doctors. I also believe in the conservation of our local heritage. Although visitors are up this year, because of global warming, I suspect, there has been a steady fall in visitor numbers over the years. I believe we should have a prioritisation of development of, the, of town developments over country developments. As a result of the crippling recession, there are a lot of boarding up premises in town. We need to upgrade the town properties, build more flats over shops and vacant premises. In order to do that, we need tax breaks and grants to develop them and need a fight so we can have a vibrant, energetic town. I believe we need a more effective environment minister. If we'd had one, we wouldn't have seen that green sludge down in St. Dobins. It would have been dealt with by now. We wouldn't have had those endless debates on Plemore. We would have had greater investment into insulation and micro-energy projects. Less traffic jams, less creeping urbanisation in the countryside and worse housing development. I believe in a population balance. I believe in financially balanced books. Vibrant and educated person. Thank you. Please vote for David Richardson. Humbly. Thank you. Thank you, David. I call Philip Balash. Uh, before you begin, uh, I wonder if um, there's a light on down there. Somebody's microphone is on. Thank you. Good evening. I want to talk tonight about a serious problem in our community, but also about some of the good things. The serious problem is unemployment, which is a curse and the government has been working strenuously with the private sector over the last three years to tackle it. A number of programmes, including the Advance to Work scheme for youngsters, have made a difference. Yet, if one looks at the figures, there were 1,500 individuals registered as actively seeking work at the time of the last elections in 2011. And uh, today, that figure is slightly higher at 1,580 and twice what it was five years ago. It's a terrible thing to want to work and to be unemployed. It saps the energy. There is no incentive to get out of bed in the morning. And worst of all, it undermines feelings of self-worth and self-respect. From the financial point of view, such a mass of unemployed people is hugely expensive in terms of income support and a vast untapped resource in our economy. It's a real problem in Jersey and one that we must keep at the forefront of our attention. What can be done about it? There are no easy answers until the economy returns to growth. The rate of unemployment soared at the time of the financial crisis in 2007 and was exacerbated by the actions of the UK government in relation to LVCR. But Jersey is still a pretty good place to live. 
The Government Statistics Unit has recently measured us against the Better Life Index of the OECD, the so-called Club of Rich Countries, and we come out in the top half, above France, the UK and Ireland. We know that we live in a safe and beautiful place. The churches and our honorary traditions make this island a particularly caring environment, even if we could perhaps uh, do more for the minority communities. The government should obviously continue its work programs, but I hope that this effort could spread to the wider community. The National Trust intends to give work to the unemployed when the restoration of Plemont uh, takes place. Could other organisations and individuals be innovative in thinking of ways in which employment, even temporary or part-time work, can be offered to those who want to get back into the workplace, enjoy social interactions and earn a measure of self-respect? I certainly hope that uh, they can. Thank you very much. Thank you, Philip. I call Anne Southern. Good evening. I've noticed that many candidates have plastered their posters with evaluative adjectives or abstract nouns, though they're rather short on doing words. I've none of these, relying only on the slogan, working for a fairer society. But if I did, they would probably be intelligence, honesty, and logic. I have the intelligence to see through the platitudes, the honesty to call them out, and the logical ability to construct a more rational vision. You will be told that we must not raise taxes, though it's odd that all the outgoing ministers say we will have to in order to maintain our services and cater for an ageing population. You will be told that efficiency savings can balance the books. But having been involved in the modernisation process, I can tell you that progress is extremely slow. A natural wastage can't reduce numbers in the civil service very easily. Key staff, whether engineers or directors of education, have to be replaced. You will also be told that the answer is growth, though it's unclear what that means. The sort of growth I would like to see is not the sort that will swell the population, but the growth that will come from putting money into the pockets of the low paid. The level of the minimum wage, only 4% above the UK rate, although um, the cost of living is 20% higher, is shameful. If you're a taxpayer, you are subsidising the employers' and shareholders' profits to the tune of some £40 million a year by providing the income support that will enable minimum wage earners to survive. Reform Jersey is not all about tax and spend. Low-paid workers will spend all the extra money they have, giving a boost to local businesses. Good employers know that it is good business to ensure that workers can afford to buy their products. We also want to end the abuse of zero-hour contracts, especially those with exclusivity clauses, so workers have the security to enable them to spend more freely. So, many of our policies are designed to produce growth. We also believe that spending now can produce savings later. We support affordable GP visits, which will ensure that illnesses are caught before they become ex increasingly expensive to treat. We support the free provision of quality dressings for people in the care of family nursing, so ulcers and wounds heal more quickly and ensure the most effective use of nurses' time. We support restoring the funding to the dental fitness scheme for young people so they have healthy teeth that will not need expensive treatment later on. We support access to justice initiatives that will cut down on expensive court time. These ideas are cohesive and logical. To put my honesty and clear thinking to work, please give me one of your votes. Thank you, Anne. I call Lyndon Farnham. Thank you. Uh, good evening. As I arrived in St Lawrence this evening, I couldn't help but continue to reflect on the rather unfair JEP headlines of last week. And I quote, 
our education system is an embarrassment. Now, not only do I think that this statement is overly harsh on our teachers, but it's also very unfair on our young people who are working very hard and generally very successfully in the present system. Is our education system an embarrassment? No, of course it's not. Could we do better? Yes, I think we could. Does it need review? Yes, it does. And in supporting a review, I'm particularly keen to encourage schools to place more focus on skills. Skills taught at a younger age. Skills that will prepare our young people for work in our economy. Vocational skills, life skills, character development, good citizenship, and the passing on of our own heritage and history. In order to focus on its critical key objectives, I will propose that education becomes a stand-alone department, and that responsibility for sport and culture, which are now also recognised as important economic drivers, are moved into the economic development department where they can thrive along with the rest of the economy. I also believe that it is time to give consideration to ring fencing and thus protecting funding for schools and hospitals. I am the Serving Assistant Minister at Home Affairs, where I hold special responsibility for the Jersey Fire and Rescue Service and the Prison Service, and I know we are all extremely proud of our emergency services, but I am especially proud to have served there at a time when we have seen improvements in many areas, including positive changes to the police force, which has led to greater confidence, and I'm pleased to report this evening that crime in Jersey continues to fall. I have successfully brought a number of propositions to state since being re-elected re in 2011, including uh, a, a, a proposition to, um, for a, a political accountability for our justice system, and I now sit on the Justice Advisory Panel and the Bayless uh, Consultative Panel. I am the immediate past president of the Jersey Hospitality Association and continue to champion tourism as an important pillar of our economy. I fully support the long overdue rejuvenation of Fort Regent and I am leading a campaign and, and there's a lot to do to safeguard our future, which is why we need people with real experience and we need people who are sensible and able and proficient. So we must use our votes carefully. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. <clears throat> Thank you, Lyndon. I call Ian Gorst. Uh, thank you. Uh, good evening, ladies and gentlemen. I'm Ian Gorst, and it's been an honour for me to serve as Chief Minister for the last three years. During those three years, I've sought to build consensus, to face our problems, and to make difficult decisions. Uh, this week, I'm speaking about a different subject at each of the Hustings meeting, so uh, forgive me if I don't speak about a subject which is of particular interest to you, uh, but hopefully I'll have said something about it on my website, which I'd be delighted if you could visit. This evening, I'm going to focus on health, the same subject that Andrew chose. Um, as a community, we must accept that we are living longer and with this advance come challenges for our healthcare. We must also accept that over the last 20 years we have not spent enough on healthcare and social services. That's why we developed the new strategy for health called Caring for our, Each Other, Caring for Ourselves. And that's an exciting plan, but it must be carefully delivered over the next few years. I believe fundamentally in patient-centred care provided in a coordinated way. All that we do must focus on the care and the outcome for the patient and not for the system. We are facing a unique opportunity to ensure that our reforms deliver this and we must and we are looking around the world for models that we can learn from. Care providers both primary and secondary providers, must work together in the best interests of the patient and the community. I believe that we can deliver this if we work together to overcome traditional system silos and traditional interests and work on a whole system approach. We know that we need greater support for early years and that's why I support the 1001 Days programme. We know that health have been leading the Lean Efficiency programme, but we also know that improving productivity will be even more important in the future. 
We know that we need a new hospital, and we've just announced a space to consider the full costs of a dual versus a single site option, and the final decision will be made by the states. We have to deal with the mental health provision and provide more. We have to deal with respite provision, and we have to uh, make sure there's appropriate provision for those with disabilities. During this government, we've increased health funding by £30 million, but more is needed, and we will need an open and honest debate about how we are going to pay for that increased need. We know that we have many hard-working and committed frontline staff, and I thank them for their work. So we've made a good start, but there is still much to do. It would be an honour to be given the opportunity to utilise my experience, motivation and energy to continue to serve you and build a healthy and secure future for us all. Thank you. I call Philip Ozef. Uh, uh, ladies and gentlemen, uh, for the last uh, six years I have served as your Treasury Minister. Uh, this has coincided um, with some of the most difficult and challenging uh, times that the island and indeed uh, the worldwide uh, community has seen uh, for generations. Ladies and gentlemen, the easy thing in politics is to put decisions off. During my time in politics, I have been asked to serve in some of the most difficult states' departments, uh, some of them uh, called the poison chalices of politics. In the last uh, six years, um, I have had to make some extremely difficult decisions, uh, some of them uh, controversial. Some of the decisions that uh, have been asked to be accepted have been difficult to uh, explain, particularly when it compromises short-term uh, popularity uh, for long-term benefit. I understand that there has been a perfectly understandable and reasonable debate about public finances. What I want to say to you this evening is, despite these difficulties, over the last three to six years, we have invested. We've got 4,500 people back to work, including, as Sir Philip has said, 300 long-term unemployed people. Without that action, we'd have seen unemployment rising to more than 4,000. Uh, we've created a community jobs fund. We've provided incentives for youth and the hospitality sector, a sector which, as Alan McLean said, is now growing again. We've started a construction training programme. We've put in a new apprenticeship programme, Chore Trackers. We've enabled 50 families uh, to get into the dream of home ownership uh, with our deposit loan scheme. We've dramatically improved social housing. And with the bond that Andrew Green and I worked on, 250 million uh, delivered at a 40-year fixed rate uh, that is the envy of all. With economic development, we've invested in uh, Digital Jersey. We've created Jersey business. We've invested in Highlands College. With the Chief Minister, we have restored uh, the uh, fortunes of the financial services industry. Back to work, trackers, apprenticeship schemes, uh, and much more. I understand that there have been uh, the people concerned, and I understand that they have been the doubters. Uh, but I say to people of you at St. Lawrence that the policies are working. Uh, we have delivered a tax cut for the majority um, of working islanders, uh, and the economy has turned the corner. I am confident that the policies that have been difficult are the right ones. I believe that I have got a track record of delivery, energy and commitment, and I hope that you would like me to continue to serve Jersey uh, as one of your eight choices. Thank you very much. Thank you, Philip. I call Malcolm Ferry. Uh, Mrs. Conatar, ladies and gentlemen, <clears throat> as Chief Executive of the Jersey Citizens Advice Bureau, on a day-to-day -day basis, I see the problems that people face. And for that reason, I would like to make a difference and tackle these problems from the inside. And that's why I'm standing in these elections. When you get a chance, I would ask that you click on my website, malcolmvary.com, where you can see and hear my campaign video and I'll explain all the issues that I feel are important to Jersey. Um, if I'm elected, with the support of the House, I would like to put myself forward for a ministry. 
and social security would be my first choice. Not least because I've spent 12 years working in that department and I understand the inner workings of the benefit system, the unemployment assistant, assistance, return to work schemes, minimum wage mechanisms, family friendly proposals, the long term care scheme and discrimination legislation. It is clear that there will be financial pressures on the ring-fenced Social Security Health Insurance Funds and that in the very near future, tough decisions may have to be made to protect the integrity of those funds. I would like to make sure that any such remedies are necessary and realistic. In relation to law and order, having spent some time as a centenaire in the parish of St Helier, I understand the pressures faced by the Henri police. Training, consistency in decision making, professionalism and treatment of first offenders are all areas that will require special attention if we are to maintain this vital community service to our island. Jersey is steeped in the volunteer tradition and our honorary police are a shining example of all that makes this community so strong. So if you want to see a new face and have some new thinking in the States Assembly, but you also want someone who understands the island's traditional values, then please consider me for one of your crosses on polling day. I have worked hard and made changes in every position that I have held so far in my career. And I can promise that as a States member, my resolve would be just as strong. My mentor once at Social Security told me, in management, and indeed any position that you hold in life, you're only as good as the people that are prepared to support you. I respectfully ask that you good people support me in this election. Thank you. Thank you, Malcolm. I call Guy Defay. Madam Connetab, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, well, we all thought we lived in a uh, low-tax, low-spend environment, and now we're beginning to discover that that is nowhere near the case. And it is only fair to point out that those states members who've served for three years and those for six all have to share a level of responsibility of the position we find ourselves in now, where we can no longer balance the books, where we're told that the current account is standing at minus £50 million, where we are borrowing very expensive amounts of money, £200 million to assist the new Andium housing project. A speculative 450 million is going to have to be spent on the hospital. Roughly another 200 or so million is going to go uh, on the uh, liquid waste strategy. And I know from my previous ministerial experience there must be at least 150 drainage projects that are still sitting there. There is an enormous number of capital expenditure that we have to deal with. Plus, uh, last time I looked, the, uh, the, pension, the public pension fund was not due to be uh, paid off until 2080. I don't know the latest figures, but that is another debt. We have an astonishing amount of debt to deal with. And the burden is continually coming back to how can we find uh, more tax to extract. I say it's time to take a break on taxing, particularly the middle and low wage earners, and let's see if we can shift the burden to those in our economy who can actually afford it. Now, there doesn't seem to be much doubt at all, given that our public services has now grown to over 7,000 public service employees, that we're going to have to look at trimming government. And why not? It is time to decide what is essential and what is nice to have. When I was the first uh, a minister on the Council of Ministers, I warned way back then that we had to stick to budgets and we had to plough money into infrastructure and maintenance. And it took time and time and time, nothing happened. Happened. I was the first to warn that, by the way, the Cavern project hadn't been completed. It's still being completed now. That is over 10 years later. 
If you want more of the same, and frankly all I hear from our state's members is how keen they are to spend yet more of the money, uh, I'd be uh, sincerely worried. What I can offer to you are creative solutions to problems. You may not like all of them, but either way, they'd still have to get through a state's assembly to be approved. But that is what we need now. We need creative solutions to find our way out of the problems we currently face. I offer you this uh, simple message. I will look for those solutions. I will deal with everything honestly, and I will do, deal with you straightforwardly, tell you what the story is, and then you decide. Thank you, Guy. I call Conrad Krasinski. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Um, my name is Conrad Krasinski. Thank you all for coming to listen to me and to other candidates tonight. Um, now, adding to what Guy Defoe just said, in 2013, the survey highlighted a serious income gap with 45% of islanders stating that they had difficulty paying their bills and only 25% reporting confidence in the government. So what it means? It means that the sole focus on economic growth has left the island without consideration for population control and with curriculum infrastructure. Um, another town hotel is closing down to make way for profiting in the sale of flats. Youth unemployment is affecting work ethics, fostering idleness amongst young people. So I'm asking you, is this the way forward? I think you already have an answer. I'm standing here to encourage you, the electorate, to elect me to the office of senator as a person ab above all divisiveness and free from any political alliances. I am the voice of ordinary people and I will work for ordinary people. Those who work very hard every day and pay their bills and taxes. Those who are faced with problems resulting from the ill-conceived system of socio-economic policy, which is unfit for purpose. And those responsible remain impotent, persistently telling us that everything is going towards the better. Ladies and gentlemen, this is your call. Give me a chance to introduce new ideas that will improve the quality of our everyday life. Give me a chance to propose new opportunities to respond to your dissatisfaction and regret about the direction our society has taken in recent years. I'd like to know you that my candidacy for the office of senator is founded upon my sincere belief, my sincere desire to be closely involved in public affairs and to speak for people's needs. I will insist on resolving problems that affect each of us and tackle challenges to improve our prospect and standard of living. I believe that fresh people with fresh ideas will understand and tackle the current issues you are facing by an active engagement with ordinary people, not just at election time as usually happens, but during the whole term. And I assure you now that I will always be available to meet with you to listen to your concern on a regular basis. My plan is simple. I want to make Jersey the way you have seen it yourself decades ago. So I will support and incentivize development of small businesses, support and develop young talents, especially those from indigenous families, to help them become a sustainable link in our economy, reform the housing legislation, reduce doctor fees, introduce new ways to energy solutions, providing clean and sustainable electric power. Ladies and gentlemen, let's put aside our differences and together we will make Jersey a better place. Once again, thank you very much for listening. Thank you, Conrad. I call John Young. Uh, good, e uh, good evening, ladies and gentlemen. It's a real pleasure to be uh, back here in St. Lawrence, where I lived for 20 years. And I can remember in this hall uh, proposing the designations of parish green lanes. And of course, the parish is the heart of our community, involving people closely in decisions which affect our lives. And this is how things used to work in the States in the days before we had ministers. All States members were involved in government. But as a backbench deputy for St Brillard's, I've tried to influence policy through scrutiny in such things like energy policy and uh, incinerator ash policy and treatments and so on, and also as an individual member. And I've chaired the scrutiny panel, gained state's agreement to propositions setting planning policies and planning law, uh, tax and pensions measures, and, and saved Pickett House for a heritage being just a few. 
But time limits me to just mention a few policy issues. Firstly, we must diversify our economy, encourage new enterprise, and remove unnecessary bureaucracy. We must open creative and IT structures and open up new ones, renewable energy technology especially, and support event and tourism. On environment, we must conserve the natural beauty of Jersey and manage the effect of population growth on our infrastructure needs and land use. Health. We must meet the health needs of our ageing population and provide access to primary health care for all. Education. Our service must meet the skills and needs of our economy and our children's futures. Finance. We have to correct the imbalance of public spending and taxation by spending priorities, setting its priorities on education, health and public sector reform. Now, eight of the current ministers are candidates for re-elections on this platform and standing on their record. And several have been in there for six years. And I, I ask you, ask yourself, have these ministers delivered joined up and inclusive governments? Are you confident that the ministers have the right mix of qualities, experience and skills to meet the challenges? And of course, you've heard plenty from ministers about their record. And there's some big questions to ask them. Why has education not received attention until now? Could more have been done? Why do some of our GPs have low confidence in the direction of health strategy? Why wasn't the deterioration of our public finances identified and policy responses starting to be developed sooner before we get into an election? It's time for change. With change, government can improve and can regain trust. I'm standing for election to offer you the choice of the challenge. I offer you my experience as a state's member and careers in the private sector. I'm independent. I decide what's best. If elected, I will save elections to the Prime Minister. I invite you to one of your votes. Thank you very much. Thank you, John. Before I call Paul Routier, May I just remind candidates to use their microphones? Um, John does have a loud voice, but it would be easier if you use your mics, particularly as it's being recorded. Thank you. I now call Paul Routier. Uh, thank you, Madam Connetarp. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. As one of the uh, last uh, senators to have been elected to serve a, a six-year term, uh, I have uh, seen several failed attempts to uh, alter the election process and the constitution of the states. What is concerning for me is, th is that the Assembly has spent far too much time discussing itself and not enough time focusing on the needs of our community. Uh, and a real disgrace uh, was the outrageous refusal of some states' members to reject the outcome of the last referendum. Now, I'm wearing a, a yes sticker for, to keep the constables because I know the value of having uh, the, their contribution in the states. Uh, but if the referendum result uh, is no, I will accept that decision. Uh, for the last six years as Assistant Chief Minister, I have undertaken and completed several significant complex projects. I was pleased that the Chief Minister asked me to oversee social policy and that we have established a social policy unit uh, in the Chief Minister's department. It shows our commitment to addressing the needs of our community. I led the debate uh, of the Charities Law, which was enthusiastically welcomed by the voluntary and community sector, and I hope to progress the, the next phase of the law. I currently chair the new Adults Policy Group for important matters of safeguarding. This area of work can be very difficult at times, and it is our duty to ensure that services are the best that they can be. If elected, I want to continue the work to ensure that the inclusive equality strategy for people with disabilities is finalised, and I'm pleased other candidates uh, on the platform tonight are supporting this. I want to progress the new mental health and capacity law and to conclude the complex access to justice uh, review which I have chaired, and to go on to implement the recommendations. Previously, as the Social Security Minister, I showed strong leadership transforming the benefit system and introducing workplace protection for both employees and employers. I increased the subsidy for primary health prescriptions, and I know that free prescriptions have helped many people have better health outcomes. 
Whilst we are considering the options for a new hospital building, I will be putting pressure on the new health minister to focus on social services for people with mental health uh, issues and also children and adults with learning disabilities. It is said that if you want a job done, you ask a busy man. These are challenging times which require clear thinking. I do hope that I have shown that I have the skills, compassion and business sense to make sound decisions. If you would like me to continue working for you, uh, I, would, I would be really pleased if you consider me for one of your votes. Thank you. Thank you, Paul. I call Jeff Haben. Madam Kleintabler, ladies and gentlemen of St Lawrence, good evening to you. I'm a businessman, I'm a management accountant, I have a proven track record in business here and elsewhere. Why am I standing here? Frankly, I'm just disappointed in the assembly of the last few years. I'm disappointed that I have not seen enough people put Jersey first and its whole community. I'm disappointed at a blatant lack of common sense in so many things. And I'm very disappointed in the disconnect between the Assembly and the public, largely caused by ignoring you in the referendum. Finance industry, digital jersey, tourism being well supported and quite rightly so. But I'm disappointed again, we're not supporting the small businesses. Thousands of them, thousands of employees struggling, we must give them a lighter touch. I'm disappointed that Highlands has not been given adequate help to, to grow, to give further education, vocational training and more university course, courses more quickly. It is now becoming a problem for so many families where they have children who would like to go to university and they can't because they cannot afford to the, the living cost of these children off the island. <coughs> I'm disappointed that it takes so long for some people to see a specialist in the hospital. It can take two years to get a hip or a knee replaced. That these people become people that are basically completely disabled. Their quality of life is gone and they are non-productive. All the things I have mentioned and all the things that we have to face going forward are part of what we call the reform of all the departments within the states. But the assembly must react quicker. Talk, expensive consultants, more talk, more consultants. We have to cut it down, we have to slim it down, we have to be more reactive. I have spent my whole life being proactive and reactive in a business environment. And this must be, the same principles must be applied to the states. And I really would like to be part of this process on behalf of you all. The Assembly needs to listen and it needs to see what needs to be done and it needs to be doing it as quickly as possible. I would like to represent you. I'm a fresh face, fresh view, and I do like to get on with things. And I would like your vote. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you, Jeff. I call Sarah Ferguson. Thank you. This is an important election. State spending keeps rising and our income is falling. The FPP tell us that the projected deficits are at the top end of what is appropriate. And the problem with deficit fi financing is that it can grow to become a habit. Ask anyone trying to pay off an overdraft or a payday loan. We have assets to cover this but we have fewer people paying tax and no new source of income for the states to balance this. Last year we reduced the marginal rate by 1%. This reduced states' income by £8 million. Removal of the deemed distribution has lost us another £6 million. Not a lot in the scheme of things, but £8 million here, £6 million there soon adds up. We've been under pressure from outside agencies regarding our internal tax systems and we've been forced to change some of the systems. 
we need to re-examine our tax system to put the island back on the principled and simple path charted by Cyril Marcond back in the 60s. Now, the Corporate Services Scrutiny Panel, of which I'm the chairman, I'm not a minister, there's eight, seven of them and me, um, has examined the budget in detail. Our advisers were particularly concerned that the link between income and expenditure has been lost. We have a deficit, in total over 100 million, and around 50 million pounds of that on current account. Some of this is structural. And the only way to deal with a structural deficit is to increase income, which means taxes, and reduce spending, which could mean services. But in my experience, efficiencies can cut costs, not services. But that's all been left until after the election. Interestingly, the improvement in GVA that's been talked about has come from everything but finance, construction and manufacturing. It's come from the tourism, which has had a good time recently. But what scrutiny doesn't publicize enough is that over 75% of our recommendations are accepted by ministers. And for instance, the budget, all our recommendations have been accepted. Computerized care records at health, all accepted. You'll hear many promises during elections. I merely ask you to ask, how much will it cost and where will the money come from? This is a very important election. Your vote is your voice and it matters. Please vote for me. I now call Chris McGee. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Chris McGee. I have a law degree with honours from the University of Edinburgh, and at 25 years old, I am the youngest candidate, although you probably already know that by now. Um, I've written all my hosting speeches from scratch, so if you want to check out any of the others, go to facebook.com slash senator or youtube.com slash senator. I didn't talk about it in my last speech, so tonight I'm going to talk to you about cannabis. Right now, we can ease the suffering of those on the island with medical conditions, which cannabis has proven to be a more effective and cheaper <coughs> medicine than what the suffering are currently being offered. Islanders with MS, cancer, PTSD, epilepsy, Crohn's disease, fibromyalgia, glaucoma, the list goes on. I've personally met with Islanders suffering from some of these conditions. Others have contacted me having heard about my campaign. Why is it that right now politicians and police are getting in the way of doctors' professional opinions, laughing in the face of a plethora of studies which unequivocally show that cannabis has many, many medicinal properties? In addition to helping those in need, which, correct me if I'm wrong, is the whole point in having a health service, we can create jobs, increase tourism and boost agriculture, all whilst bringing the island out of the debt that we've been stuck in through the legislation legalisation of cannabis. The amount of greenhouses I've seen that are full of brambles being left to decay because peppers or tomatoes are no longer economically viable. The amount of underground bunkers that have been boarded up, secure locations which currently serve no purpose. Just look at St Lawrence's own fungi delecti. They operate out of an underground bunker and are doing very well. Builders and carpenters will be needed to fit them out, electricians to wire them, plumbers, security guards, growers, scientists, salesmen, tax-paying positions that would reduce unemployment and generate income which the states are currently scrambling to find. Read the property tax green paper to see how desperate this scrambling has become. Millions of euro pounds have already been spent on enforcing the prohibition of cannabis. It hasn't worked looking back, it won't work going forward. Enough is enough. The truth is cannabis is always going to be in Jersey, as this is the economic law of supply and demand. Every time the police kick somebody's door in and find some, is further proof that prohibition doesn't work. Perhaps it's my law degree showing through, but ask yourself, key bono, who benefits most from the status quo? Dealers. Look at 1920s America. It was prohibition that created Al Capones, the Gambinos, the Jewish Mafia. Demand for alcohol stayed the same, yet the price skyrocket skyrocketed because of prohibition. This allowed the bootleggers to make ridiculous tax-free profits, which were then used to fund other operations like gun running and racketeering. Curtis Warren even himself said that his biggest expenditure was bribery. But what about the kids, you may say? Who will protect them? A dealer has two priorities. Make money, don't get caught. That's it. Your kids don't factor into the equation. 
Under my proposition, it would be illegal to supply cannabis to a minor. Quality, price, distribution would all be controlled through a regulatory framework. Through legalisation, we can take the money out of dealers' hands out and out of the black market. Wasn't that what the whole Curtis Warren case was about, or was that just about money? I could talk about this issue for hours, but time doesn't allow it. You have up to eight votes. Repeat, up to eight. If you don't think there are eight candidates that merit it, please don't tick the box just to make up the numbers. Thanks very much. Thank you, Chris. And finally, I call Sean Dooley Power. Good evening, St. Lawrence. Um, my name is Sean Power, and I am the senior deputy at the moment in St. Bernard. There aren't many um, Dooley Powers um, in Jersey and there aren't many duly powers on the electoral register in St. Lawrence. Indeed, I don't have any connections in St. Lawrence. Um, my best connection in St. Lawrence is that I share the stewardship and administration of the JSPCA with Steve Coleman, standing over there, um, who is one of your centenaries. So why am I standing for senator? Most of my work that has been given to me by the Assembly is island-wide. That is planning, the planning panel, the poison chalice. And Senator Gorst referred to a poison chalice, and I think Senator Rosa referred to a poison chalice. If you try and work in the planning department in Jersey with Deputy De Hamill as your minister, and then you, and I, he's a good guy, but he's, you know, he has his moments. Um, if you work with Deputy De Hamill and then stitch together a planning panel that's composed of Jeremy Masso, Rod Bryans, Roy Lerissier, Gerard Boda, I can tell you I have some grey hairs after the last few years. So I do the best I can and in terms of my shopping list of what would I do if I were a minister, I don't have one. I would sit down, with the, if I was elected, I would sit down with the new chief minister, he's probably sitting here tonight, I think that's a fair deduction, and I would ask him or her, what would you like me to do? And because my job, and as you will see in my manifesto that you may be sitting on or you have on your lap, my manifesto says that my job is to serve the public. And that's what I've done as best as I can for the last nine years. And I've made mistakes. But you learn from your mistakes and you learn not to repeat them. I wrote to Senator Balash in 2012 on the Electoral Commission work and I said, I believe in the role of the island-wide mandate. I believe in the role of the senator. I believe in the importance of the senator. And my recommendation to Senator Balash was for 30 senators and 12 constables. That was rejected by the um, Electoral Commission on the grounds that the ballot paper would be too long. But if they do it in China, Russia, and the Far East with hundreds of names, I think we can do it in Jersey. So that was, what, and then I joined option B, and that was rejected by the Assembly. I could go on, I can't go on. You have a list of what I do, the JSPCA, I set up Sanctuary House with Mark Bond, I Community Relations Trust, I drive trucks to Romania, I do the very best I can for the public, and that's what I would do again. So I ask you, for one of your eight votes, would you please consider me? Thank you very much. to the candidates for their speeches. As I mentioned earlier, we now come to question time. And I would ask that questions, first of all, come from parishioners of St. Lawrence, please. As I said, I will take three questions and the candidates will answer the three together. My understanding is that the first set of questions will be addressed to Andrew Green at number one and the second set of questions will be addressed, first of all, to Malcolm Ferry, who is candidate number ten this evening. Our deputy, Lafondre, is going to walk with the roving mic and he's going to come to you for you to put your questions. Um, to be fair to the candidates, please keep them brief, keep them succinct, uh, so that they actually are able to understand what the question is. Who wants to go first? Okay. Um, can I ask you please to give your name and then the question? Thank you. My name is Sue Noble. 
My name is Sue Noble. Um, you've mentioned some of you about our ageing population. What I am particularly concerned about is what would you do to help the old people who many of them have dementia and Alzheimer's, and their families are desperate, they can't cope with them at home, and there just doesn't seem to be the facilities to look after them all. And I would just give you a little clue of St. Saviour's Hospital. I think that's the White Elephant or the other Fort Regent in our island. Thank you. Uh, I've seen Nick Palmer. Um. A sort of a source of dissatisfaction with the electorate in general is that uh, politicians promise a lot when they want to be elected, and then a few months later on, uh, they change their minds, and uh, then people say, "Oh, they're all useless." Now, well, I've read through all this lot, and there's lots and lots of promises and wish lists. Uh, my question is this: um, When you get elected, or if you get elected, uh, you might go to, uh, 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 you know, with the question, with the uh, promises you made, and in a few, you'll, you'll, you will be knocked back by the civil servants or the treasury minister, who will tell you that there is not enough money or it's impractical. What I want to know is, uh, certainly of the people who want to be elected, is what specialist knowledge do you have, which you feel will enable you to out-argue the civil servants and the treasury ministers, uh, treasury minister, and also to those people who are already thank elected. Thank you, thank you, Nick. We've had your question. Um, uh, it's just for the people who are already elected, uh, how have they succeeded in out-arguing the civil servants or the Treasury Minister? Okay, thank you. Do I have another question? I saw Centineer Coleman. Good evening. My question is to do with immigration. In the UK, they've abolished the right to retire at 65 and allowed people to continue. This has had a net effect on the revenue of the exchequer in the UK. Why is this not being considered in Jersey, where there are many people known as the silver skill set who could provide from the age of 55 onwards very valuable work to companies and businesses, uh, and thus reduce immigration, but provide revenue yet again for the exchequer, which is sorely needed? Sorry? The question, please. Yes, um, okay, I was just about to um, try and ensure that all the candidates are clear on what the questions were. First of all, Sue Noble, my understanding is that she asked how you would cope with the elderly, uh, many of whom are suffering from dementia, so her question was how would you deal with the ageing population? especially those who can't be kept at home. Uh, Nick Palmer asked what skills you would take to um, address those civil servants who perhaps um, were trying to argue against what your proposed policies would be. Is that correct, Nick? Thank you. And the third question from Centenia Coleman concerned immigration. Um, I was actually trying to write it down as you asked it, Steve, but I in, think... In essence, using those who have taken the time... Okay, thank you. We know, we know your question. <laughs> so before I ask Andrew Green to begin to answer, can I just verify that all candidates are satisfied yeah. that they are aware of the questions? Thank you. So as we agreed, the, you will have one and a half minutes, and after one minute, the bell will be sounded. Okay, thank you. I call Andrew Green. Thank you, Connie Tubb. And of course, they're all big questions, and I could spend the whole one and a half minutes just answering the first question. But the ageing population, and particularly those with dementia, is a challenge that every uh, Western community is going to have to face. I have no magic solutions, but I do know that we do, do need to spend money in that direction. And we also need to spend money before they go into hospital supporting the carers. I don't think we give, but in fact, I know that carers do not get enough support either. So there's a lot of work to, to be done there. Uh, Mr Palmer's question about um, promises. I've made only one promise 
I've, made, I've not got a wish list of things that I would like to see there. I've given some thoughts in my manifesto, but this is my promise, to continue to work hard for the best interests of the island. That's the best I can do. If I get the ministry, if I get back in, if you elect me, and I get the ministry I want, I'll work just as hard in transforming health as I've worked in Retirement. I don't understand why we've got to retire at 65, why people have that. Uh, I, I do know that when my grandmother was 60, she was a very old lady. Well, I'm past 60, I'm not an old man, I'm not ready to retire, and I don't see why anybody else should. With regard to um, the ageing population and dementia, this used to be a lot better um, looked after, I think, when I first came back to the island. We had very good services supported by um, the Andrew Lefevre delivered. And now it's been undermined by too many assessments and process to actually get practical help. So I try and reduce that back and be offering and spending the money just offering the practical help. And I do think we need more um, beds in, mental, in the mental health area. The, the long-term care law will ho also hopefully help that. As regards my experience, I've got 25 years' experience as a GP listening to islanders from all backgrounds and walks of life. I've worked for, as medical advisor for the children's service and in community clinics. So I've got other experience outside general practice. And I'm also a representative for the Royal College of General Practitioners um, and help with policy development in child and mental health in the UK. Um, immigration. I, I absolutely, the pension was set at a time where people, the life expectancy was much less than it is now and it isn't fit for purpose. So I think, yes, um, at 65, lots of people have got added extra to add. Thank you. Alan McLean. Uh, thank you very much. Um, Sue, your question about um, dementia, and uh, this is a problem clearly with an ageing population. We understand it. I actually have a family member who's uh, at the early stages, so I do understand the difficulty we have with dealing uh, with that family member in our own home. Um, and we do get to a point where you need support in the community. Uh, investment in health, and I think in the past with comprehensive spending reviews and such like, we've tended to cut health, education, right across the piece. We have to ring fence and make sure we invest properly in the area is where there's genuine need and with an aging population clearly this is an area that needs attention. Um, Nick uh, Palmer about um, how uh, effectively we avoid capture uh, I think you're referring to. Uh, ministers need um, to be determined, they need to be decisive. I'm one of the few ministers that's issued a direction to uh, a chief officer to get something done. Uh, it can be done, we have powers under the law. Um, I also think it's important that we have external advisors. We see this in other jurisdictions but under the ministerial system the need needs to be external advisors as part of the ministerial setup with the right expertise to advise. I think that's important. Um, and finally, um, Mr. Coleman, uh, Mr. Coleman, sorry, uh, with regard to your uh, question, there needs to be more flexibility with regard to employment uh, legislation altogether. There's a huge amount of experience uh, with our senior citizens uh, and we want to tap into that. You're right, it will help with um, the immigration challenges uh, and we're not doing enough, I don't think, in order to encourage and incentivize. There has to be the right incentives. You can look at places like Germany, where they have a whole raft of incentives from an employment point of view to encourage that type of thing. Thank you, David Richardson. Yeah, uh, Mrs. Noble, ageing population. I used to work in uh, MIND, or was for Jersey Focus on Mental Health. Uh, we have a series of advocacies there to help bring in people. I think we ought to help them identify those people with those sort of uh, problems of Alzheimer's and ageing. Um, I think we need extra carers. We need to be able to bring them in if we can't afford them locally. You can fly people in from very far places of the world and do it for short contracts and go back. We obviously need extra beds, as Zoe was saying, and a much more understanding of approach. 
I think now, uh, Mr. Palmer, with regards to specialist knowledge, which I have, I have an extensive knowledge in the environment, energy, and I can read a balance sheet. Therefore, I can help in many areas in the, that respect. Um, as for retirement, um, I couldn't afford to retire at 20, uh, 65 anyway, so I hope I will be able to carry on being employed. I hope there are incentives there to keep us going, and I hope that it keeps us health and, fit, um, health and fit. I think by keeping people fit when they're young, this will help us in our old age. Thank you. So I'm just... Thank you. I'll call Philip Balash. I, I know that uh, this is not what uh, Mrs Noble perhaps wants to hear, but I do think it's very important that uh, elderly people should be um, encouraged and uh, enabled to remain in their own homes for as long as it is uh, physically possible, uh, because uh, uh, certainly so far as my own family experiences are concerned, uh, that was what uh, elderly people wanted. Um, so far as um, investment is concerned, there are many, like hospice, which do a marvellous job, and I certainly uh, agree with other speakers who have said that investment in such institutions um, ought to be uh, increased if possible. Um, uh, Mr. Palmer, sometimes um, civil servants are right, and um, it's their job to give politicians uh, independent advice, which uh, politicians sometimes don't want to hear. Um, and in particular, whereas politicians may have a bright idea, it may be simply too expensive to implement. Uh, I would use my advocacy skills and have done to challenge advice uh, from civil servants. Um, I confess that uh, I am already over 65 and uh, I strongly believe that uh, retirement should be a gradual process. I think uh, people ought to be encouraged in any possible way to work beyond the age of 55 or 65 because uh, many people have a great deal to offer. I hope that I do. Thank you, Anne Southern. Good evening, Sue. I understand your question about Alzheimer's because I know with the best will in the world, you can't care for somebody with Alzheimer's at home indefinitely. They're a danger to themselves, their personality changes, uh, it, it just becomes impossible. And I had a friend who had her elderly mother over from the UK and looked after her, and it became absolutely impossible to care for her um, just before she reached the three-year residency, and she couldn't be cared for any anywhere in Jersey. I think we should have a reciprocal arrangement. So if we have parents who are from the UK or if we need to be looked after by our children in the UK, we can, we can be cared for where we have family and I think no expense should be spared in this area. Um, in terms of specialist knowledge, I have been a teacher's union leader for eight years and I have spent all that time negotiating with the Director of Education. I've won some arguments, some I haven't, but I think I've always put my case forcefully for the benefit of teachers. Um, older people to keep working. Well, yes, I mean, anti-discrimination is working its way through and age discrimination is going to have to come. If people don't get their pensions till they're 67, we can't have them thrown out of work. The only thing I don't want to see happen is for uh, civil servants to take their pensions and then get re-employed as consultants on a double whammy. So, uh, so yeah, I'm 65 and I'm seeking a second job, which... Uh, <laughs> Everything. Thank you. Thank you, Lyndon Farnham. Um, thank you. I can speak with first hand experience. I lost my dad last year. Uh, he suffered with Parkinson's. It took him very quickly. The level of service, uh, of care he uh, had received was excellent. Um, he started in a nursing home, moved on quickly to St. Saviour's, where he spent six months for evaluation, and the staff were brilliant, but the facilities um, were very poor, and he ended up in Silver Springs, uh, where again, um, the, uh, the facilities were better, uh, and, and the, the, the care was excellent. But um, this, we're just beginning to understand now the, these problems. There are a lot more um, 
people suffering it and are, go uh, and are going to suffer it in the States are making uh, uh, plans now to deal with that. We're going to need a, to provide for a lot more uh, facilities in the uh, future. Um, what special knowledge... Uh, well, if, I know you don't like reading the manifestos, but I've clearly listed um, my experience. I've had a good education, a good business career. I've had some, some very good um, political experience. And I say I'm not an intellectual or an academic. My children are. They've just finished nine years of university between them, thank goodness. But I say I do have uh, a first-class uh, honours degree from the University of Life, and I hope to bring that to bear with my political work. Um, the, I think the states have agreed, um, uh, Steve, to raise the pension of age to 67. It's important that people stay active as long as they possibly can. Fortunately, unlike some other members on the platform, I have quite a few years to go to get to um, uh, that age. But the frightening statistic is the number of 85-year-olds, uh, when you know, people average age of 50 now, get to 85 is going to be 150 percent higher than it is now that's the statistic we have to think about and, and deal with and plan for thank you thank you ian ghost thank you conitar um, that's one of the reasons why i want to speak about health this evening because actually i think for a lot in our community we've not fully understood the effects of the aging demographic and these difficult conditions that we need to start to provide for now so health uh, courtesy of the treasury minister have invested in refurbing a uh, new unit but we're going to need more in the future and we we do want people to stay in their homes as long as they can but they'll only be able to do that with the long-term care scheme so that there's financial support for them but also also, if there's appropriate respite for their carers, that's a fundamental issue, and currently there isn't, which is why that's also in the uh, new strategy. But we're going to have to think differently about how we provide for these uh, conditions which we've started to do. Um, over the last three years, we have made fantastic start on everything that we said we would do in the strategic plan and everything I said I would do in my manifesto. I've not put anything in my manifesto, you need to see the full one on the website, that I don't believe I cannot deliver if you uh, re-elect me uh, as a senator, and then we'll come on to the other uh, thing later. Um, uh, it's about working with people. You sometimes get advice that you don't like, and then you tell them to go away and find a way of delivering the overall aim of what it is you want to deliver with your policy. We have a different law uh, to the United Kingdom about when you retire. It's not illegal. It's not illegal not to uh, go at that particular thing. The problem is in the contracts and the problem is dealing with employers that think that people are over the age of 55 can't work. It's not true. If you look at Germany, if you look at elsewhere in Europe, people can work much longer and that's another issue that we need to get to grips with. Philip Ozef. Light, please. Uh, Mr. Palmer, you asked, uh, uh, Ms. Noble, you asked about what we would do um, for uh, people who wanted to stay in their own homes. Well, in the first days of Anne Pryke's um, tenure as health minister, I went up uh, to uh, St. Saviour's Hospital, and I have to say, I was absolutely appalled. It was shocking. It was the Cinderella service, and we weren't delivering the care and the dignity. The people were great, the staff were great, but in circumstances that was shocking. And I'm afraid, Nick, I was persuaded immediately, and we took action, and we have refurbished all of the north of St. Saviour's, but there's more to do. Um, frankly, the whole of the provision for elderly care needs to be organised. It's unfair. Um, there is a distinction between health care, social care, primary care you pay for, uh, Secondary care at the hospital is free uh, and social care is rationed and means tested. If you're a cancer uh, patient, uh, you get excellent hospice care. Uh, but there's much more. This is the big issue in politics and we need to find the funding by growing the economy. Uh, I challenge people. I've got seven principles of how I work in the second phase of my manifesto. Uh, that's how I work in terms of challenging. Uh, and yes, I have helped the Economic Development Minister, the TTS Minister, the Housing Minister, the Chief Minister. It's about working together. My father became constable of 70. I think that says it all. Um, I think that the pension reforms which my assistant minister took through last week in the States have liberated the choices, Mr Coleman, uh, for people so that they shouldn't be thrown on the slag heap when they're 65. Uh, carry on working. It's good for you. Thank you. Uh, Sue, so a piece of work that I've been involved in through the Bureau is the Carer Support Service. 
And what that does is it connects people with care needs to care services that can help them. So, you know, the general feeling is it's better for people to be kept in their homes as long as possible, but that should not be at the detriment to the family that's around them. So people who are in that situation, you know, who cares for the carers? Who realises when they're at a point where they can no longer cope? And that's what we need to keep an eye on to make sure that other people aren't, aren't sucked into a situation that they can no longer uh, sustain. Uh, Nick, um, I touched on in my opening address the uh, ministry that I would go for and the reason that I would go for social security is because I have an understanding of the inner workings of that department so I don't think that um, my chief officer would roll a coaster over me too easily. Um, Centenaire, Coleman, uh, um, yes it's, it's great that people can, you know, we are living longer, we're living healthier lives. Equally, some people want to get to 65 and they've had enough and they want to stop and they want to play golf and do all those things. Yes, working keeps us healthy, but equally there shouldn't be pressure for people to keep working. If they can afford to retire comfortably, they should be able to do that. But in general, work is good for you and work keeps your mind and body healthy. Thank you. Well, there are measures already in place to uh, deal with some of the issues uh, our elderly population uh, has to contend with, including those who have mental health difficulties. But we must look elsewhere and see what works well, and then we cherry-pick the best ideas and apply them here to Jersey. And we must also be totally vigilant to make sure that under no circumstances that we ever set up any form of institution that allows those who cannot defend themselves because they are unable to do so get abused in any way. Now, in terms of retirement, I'm totally in favour of a flexible uh, approach to retirement, uh, but of course it has to be a realistic. Now, do I have any specialist knowledge? Uh, yes, I was a minister for three years, and I still know where a number of the bodies are buried. So I have, uh, I have certain advantages. But look, let's face facts. Civil servants are islanders like us. Uh, they share the same views and attitudes that we do. And quite frankly, if you go in as a politician with good ideas, they will listen to them. I was very lucky, I was listened to. We now have beach showers, we now have half price parking for electric vehicles and electric uh, points in the car parks. Uh, we, have a, we have a scheme of holiday lets for our forts and towers that's making a profit and giving us tremendous publicity. If you've got a good idea in the civil service, whatever department, it will fly. You can have confidence in our public servants on that score. Thank you, Conrad Christian. Um, in relation to aging population, um, one of the ways to help um, would be for engaging our youth on the basis of voluntary program. Um, I'm sure that the benefit of the cooperation will be mutual for both prospects with um, particular benefit for young people to start appreciating and respecting aging population a bit more and most importantly bring some joy to their lives. Um, for themselves, uh, learn some people skills which young people notoriously lack these days. Um, in relation to question number two, in terms of the skills I could offer you, um, as a senator and the way I could contribute. Um, I have a lot of uh, people skills. I studied politics, management and English language and I did this all while working full time, studying hard every day, devoting my free time. Um, I could spend, um, that I could have spent otherwise drinking beer in the pub every night. Um, but I didn't. Um, I want to continuously improve myself and my imperfections and I want other people to benefit from my knowledge and life experience, especially, what, um, especially the knowledge uh, Jersey gave me for the last 11 years. Thank you. Thank you. John Young. Thank you. Um, Sue, um, 
Services for the elderly with Alzheimer's, absolute priority. It's clear that we need to go into a whole service development program. Um, I don't think there's any one solution. It's a range of things. Clearly, there's a need to have partnerships with community organisations and private sectors who are actually providing that long-term care. That carries with it training and development, special to bring those skills to do that well, but also support for those in their own homes. And I think critical is respite care because really that will enable um, a group of those, uh, people in that situation to remain in their homes. Um, the funding issues of course are big. We've got the long-term care scheme. So I think there's a whole lot of ingredients that mean that one of the challenges is to develop that service for the future. Um, Steve, I'm over 65. Uh, I've worked since 16. I don't know how to stop working. Um, when I was young I was very raw and challenging. I think I've got a bit more maturity now and I I've got lots to offer. I'm not in favour of automatic retirement. Um, I think the age discrimination law is necessary. Nick, I was a chief officer. I believe civil servants work to help political members. I certainly did so. And yes, there are issues, um, but I think good relationships will so deal with that. And the Treasury Minister is in a class of his own, his oratory. I can never get a word in edgeways. Um, I have been able to persuade him on a couple of times in the States on budget matters. Uh, and I think that's a big achievement. Thank you. Thank you. Paul Ruccio. Uh, good evening. Uh, thank you. I spent an afternoon uh, a couple of weeks ago up at St. Saviour's Parish Hall with the Alzheimer's Society. And I have to say, the afternoon was... Uh, I was really impressed by uh, the way that they were helping people, and but it also made me realise the issues that are, are, are involved in caring for, for people who have uh, uh, Alzheimer's. Um, I think that uh, we need to plan very carefully to ensure that we have sufficient services. Um, uh, the, the people have talked about uh, uh, respite for carers and for trying to keep people in, in, in their own home, but the question you asked about what about when you can't uh, manage that any longer, we need to plan for that. We need to work with the voluntary organisations and the, the families themselves to find out e exactly when that time will uh, arrive and we need to be ready for that and there's a, a big piece of work to be done. Uh, Mr Palmer, um, I, when I, before I entered politics there was, uh, I went to, on a, a day's course on how to achieve things and I was uh, the, by a drum home, you can either do it from the bottom or you can do it from the top and I've tried every way, which way and you can achieve it from either way and uh, uh, certainly my uh, specific expertise has been in business and in social care and I, I think I've achieved f a fair amount during that time and, but you can achieve it without sort of banging the heads against uh, uh, coming into conflict with people. There is consensus can be achieved. Over 65 certainly should be able to work. We need The age discrimination legislation will be in place but we need to encourage good employers to actually look after their employees. Thank you, Jeff Haben. Mrs. Noble, uh, yes, I lost a parent about 18 months ago after a four and a half year battle with dementia. Awful. But it, is, it does take to the wider question of a health review for the ageing population, mental health and disability altogether, which we have to address urgently. Mr. Palmer, what special knowledge have I got? I haven't. I have no bag of magic ideas. What I do have is an ability to recognise one and get on with it, and primarily to listen to people. That's how you get them. Mr Coleman, I think people should be able to work as long as they like, as long as they're physically and mentally fit to do so for the position they're in, and they want to do so. These people have the knowledge to pass on. They're the mentors. They are essential. If they want to stay in a position, let's leave them there. Thank you. Thank you. Sarah Ferguson. Thank you. I think uh, the question about the ageing population and immigration actually run together because the island is extremely bad at hiring people who are over 50. I'm trying to help a couple of people at the moment. They're 50, 55, and they're just getting turned down for jobs left, right and centre. Um, you know, my grandfather worked till he was 88, so, you know. <laughs> 
And, but working actually keeps the brain ticking over. So you fend off Alzheimer's. The ideal situation is to keep them at home. I kept my mother at home uh, with dementia for six years because it would have killed her if I'd put her in her, uh, put her, in her home. Um, we need perhaps to get the Methodist Homes for the Aged to help more with this because they're the leading experts in the UK. Um, and they've got two homes over here and perhaps we ought to persuade them to expand. Now, as far as, uh, you know, what, what can I bring to the um, party? Yes, I've got specialist knowledge. I've got an undergraduate degree in engineering and a graduate uh, degree in business. And I've worked in the factory, in the boiler suit, um, finance industry. I've been a civil servant and I've been a retailer. And as a chairman of a scrutiny panel, I've been in the position of asking the ministers hard questions, but they have accepted our recommendations. So, there you are. Thank you. Chris McGee. I'd like to answer the questions in reverse order, if I may. Um, the people who are over 55, as you've, as you've heard, it's quite hard when you're at the end to uh, say something that no one has said before. But um, I think they do have a lot, a lot to offer, and I think that it, it should be, should be a, a freedom of choice issue. If people want to work and are able to work, they should be able to do so. I don't. Anti-discrimination law is coming in, and I think that's, that's very good. In relation to false promises made by politicians, I'm not a politician. Um, I don't have any experience in politics, and that, some would say that that is, uh, that is excellent. Some would say that that's perhaps concerning. But on, if, you look at, if you look at all the other candidates' campaign posters, you'll find their face. You won't find that on mine. For me, it's all about policies. I don't think it should come down to how your proficiency in arguing. I think the policies should speak for themselves. Um, now, going to, going to the first question, Mrs Noble, I think that there are, there are plenty of people out there who are, who are in need, and Dr Zoe Cameron, Zoe Cameron was right when she said that we need to reduce the amount of time that people are spent filling out forums and actually getting on with care. Charity begins at home, and uh, I, if elected, have pledged 10% of my salary to, to charity, so I would be doing my, my bit in that respect. And I think that Conrad made a lot of good points about uh, having a sort of volunteer programme um, to, to sort of engage the young, young people more. Thanks. And finally, again, Sean Dooley Power. Last but not least, um, Nick's question, or the answer first, and that is um, public servants tend to be risk averse. Politicians should not be completely risk averse. And we need to push the boundaries now and again. Two examples the Waitrose application to come to Jersey four years ago. Uh, the officer recommendation was not to allow them to bring in the people they needed. Um, I, well, I overturned that and uh, I allowed them to follow the Aberdeen model, the Belfast model, the New Castle model, and it was the right decision. The other example is in planning. The Germans shelled a farm called Trinity, Egypt Farm in Trinity. Um, the officer recommendation was to refuse any redevelopment of the site. Uh, I overturned it and uh, they are allowed some limited development of the damage to that farm in World War II by the Germans. Um, care of the elderly, dementia and Alzheimer's. I follow, my brother told me, and we follow the Japanese model where they have the greatest amount of people living who are extremely old. And what they do, if they, if they cannot be fully looked after by their families, they set up a little series of houses which is followed by the family and supported by the family, but with professional help. So these houses with five or six people in them are a home from home. And that's what the Japanese do. And I would recommend our help people go out there and have a look. Steve, I can't get to your question. Okay, do we have three more questions? I see this lady here, I see the gentleman behind her, and I saw the gentleman in blue over there. So the lady in red, the gentleman behind her, you know him, John, and the gentleman in blue. Hi, it's Alex Morell. Um, I'd like to know how you plan to support small businesses, considering that we make up three quarters of the island's business community. Thank you. Hi, I'm Bill Miller. Um, my question is in relation to the abuse of zero-hour contracts. Uh, Sir Philip spoke very eloquently about the debilitating, the debilitating effect of unemployment. Is that better? 
Yeah, so Philip spoke about the debilitating, debil sorry, I'll try that again, debilitating effect of unemployment. But I think equally so is when you feel you're being abused by your employer. We have um, a group of engineers who are currently installing fibre optics into the homes across the island who are on zero hour contracts. They've been working full time hours for the last 18 months. I think states' departments and states' owned companies should be above and beyond reproach. Uh, my question really is what would uh, the uh, the uh, people coming into power do to put paid to the abuse of zero hour contracts. Before I ask Malcolm Ferry to begin answering the questions, I will just make sure that you have all understood the questions, okay? So don't worry. Good okay, if you'd like to give your name, please, yeah, sir. Sorry. Ben Ludlam. Um, as a taxpayer, I'm absolutely fed up with the states being inefficient, career-minded politicians following their own whim, then saying we've got a £90 million black hole, and now we've got to raise taxes in order to fill for these inefficiencies. Bill Ogley was brought in as an expert in his field to modernise and change the states. He couldn't do that. He was sacked. In the Auditor General's report in his dismissal, he states, over the last two years, a sustained period of interference and harassment by the Deputy Chief Minister and the Treasury Minister has made it impossible to do my job. All this came to a head on the 11th of January when the Treasury Minister came in about the Treasurer's appointment in a dismissive and aggressive manner, he told me he was not happy she had been sworn in. They're referring to Laura Rowley. Uh, are you coming to your question, yeah, please? I don't want speeches. It's all right. And he couldn't work with me if he became Chief Minister. He certainly can't work with me now. Bill Ogley was given £546,000, which is 10 or 8. And your question, Mr Ludlam, is? It is, in short, yes or no, are the examples shown by chopping Bill Ogley, states ministers conducting themselves in a way and in their own code of conduct, elected members should at all times conduct themselves in a manner which will tend to maintain and strengthen the public I think I need, to fin I need to stop you there, please. You haven't asked a question. Uh -huh. Do you intend to ask a question? The question is, do states members follow their own code of conduct Elected members should at all times conduct thank you, themselves. Thank you. In the that's, the, that's the question. Thank you. Okay, candidates. Alex Morrell asked you how you would support small business. Bill Miller asked how you would deal with zero hours contracts. And Ben Ludlam asked do state members adhere to their own code of conduct? Are you satisfied with those questions? Yep. Thank you. And in that case, I'll begin by calling Malcolm Ferry. Thank you, Mrs. Conetab. OK, Alex, small business. Um, it would be easy to say, let's cut red tape for small business. But we don't want to wrap up small business in any more red tape. But there's a balance between protecting workers' rights and letting business grow. Um, I think we need to look at more initiatives for new business. So, you know, people that are starting up, they need help. Because really there's three things that business need. Businesses need a good supply chain, they need good staff, and they need a good product. You know, the town centre, I think we need to diversify the town centre so it's not just a complete row of shops, but there are other reasons to go into town other than just shopping to draw people in. So I think that would be helpful. Bill, your point on zero hours contracts. Um, I think where businesses, and there have been some high profile businesses, have let staff go and then re-employed them on zero hours contracts, and they are then doing that exact same job. It's up to the worker to recognise, in a lot of ways, that that is an abuse of a zero hours contract. But, uh, you know, why should people know that? I see people who don't even realise that they're employees when they're on a zero hours contract. We need a clear set of guidelines so that employers and employees can see what is the proper use of a zero hours contract and how it should be properly applied. OK, Ben, um, should um, ministers follow their own code of conduct? I would say absolutely. I, I don't know personally of any examples where that hasn't, that hasn't happened, but if I was in a ministerial position, that I, I, would, I would seek to follow my code of conduct. 
Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you, Malcolm. I call Guy de Fay. Uh, yes, we should uh, support small businesses, and many of them start off as one-man bands. I think, uh, for a start, we ought to look at the situation where uh, self-employed, single self-employed, are expected to pay a stamp for being an employer and a stamp for being an employee into Social Security. We also could look at uh, the recent example of the uh, small businesses was looking to get a license for a specific type of chef. I think we should, I think we should be more flexible in terms of small businesses. At the moment, it seems it's the large businesses get the massive selection of those types of license. Uh, in terms of zero hour contracts, I think we, uh, they should be um, uh, flexible in respect of. Uh, I think you should have there should be a minimum payment. I don't like the idea of people turning up for work and then being told to go home. And similarly, if you in fact build up so many hours, there ought to be some benefits that come through. Now, I don't think I can be accused of being a career-minded politician because, after all, uh, the voters boot me out in 2008, um, but I do have views on the uh, codes of conduct. I originally supported them. Uh, states members have one code and there's a tougher one uh, for ministers. But I don't want to see us going down the road of politicians judging themselves. At the end of the day, you the voters are the bosses. And if you don't like a states member's conduct, at the end of, uh, the end of their term of office, you don't vote them in again. And I think we'll see some examples of that this election. Thank you, Guy. I call Conrad Krasinski. Ladies and gentlemen, uh, how to support small uh, businesses. I believe that one of the solutions um, that will undoubtedly have significant impact on the promotion of businesses is introduction of tax relief for a period of at least two years for new enterprises. And I'm convinced that the possibility of such an incentive to start business will allow entrepreneurs to test their opportunity in the market um, without fear of debt to any financial institutions. Um, in addition to introduction of so-called um, fixed rate um, for owners um, of opportunity for one year, um, determined not uh, to GST, I'm deeply convinced that it generates too much trouble to the activities of enterprises as well as uh, causes thousands of hours lost for unnecessary work for accountants. Um, apprenticeships will be a good idea in local businesses, which in return will offer experience and will bring a wide range of skill um, of a new workforce. Um, I myself was on an apprenticeship program while in college for four years. Unpaid, it didn't do any harm. It taught me discipline, gave me work experience, and gave me opportunity to earn some life skills. Thank you. Thank you, Conrad. I call John Young. Thank you. Um, small businesses. I, I, it sounds simplistic, but the bureaucracy is really severe. There was an example recently, somebody wanted to put an A-frame outside a shop, and they had to go through planning, parish consent, licensing, and so on, a whole plethora of things. That should stop. Now, tax. I really, I think one of the things I want to see is a review of the 0-10 tax rate, because I think local businesses do have an issue of comp competing with corporate businesses trading on Ireland who don't pay tax. And so I think there's an issue there to be dealt with equally on social security. And I think these amnesties or some kind of arrangement for start-up businesses should be encouraged. On zero hours contract, absolutely there's abuse. And that abuse is happening in state's department. Dual standards. We say to people, don't do this, but we're doing it ourselves. Regulation is needed. I've raised it in the states. The social security minister is going to bring that forward. Um, and of course the big issue is that they affect the economic recovery. Because people can't make spending commitments that they don't know where their income is. Ben London's point, um, yes, PPC investigates complaints itself, that's unsatisfactory, there's a plan to have an external regulatory body of the conduct of members. But underlying his question, I think, is this issue of resolving problems of relationship and disputes between ministers and officers. We need to do that better. At the moment, we haven't got those arrangements in place. I want to see those, which I think would improve the matter. Thank you. 
you, John. I call Paul Routier. Uh, good evening. Thank you. Um, I am a small business owner. I've uh, been in business myself since sort of at the age of uh, 23, and I still have the same business. And it's been, I have to say, it's been a, a struggle. It's been successful sometimes and uh, a struggle other times. But I have to say, I have been impressed with um, uh, the social security efforts in recent times, with the uh, Jobs Fest and the Trackers uh, Apprentices schemes, and also the one that has just been announced is the support for. Uh, uh, employers to take on people for a short period of time and for social security to pay, pay the wages. I think those are, have been really very, very good. And also the um, social security have changed um, if somebody's self-employed and they want to go into uh, uh, open their business, they can have their assessment for their social security looked at afresh and so that they don't have to uh, be burdened with their perhaps higher earnings they're earning elsewhere for their first year. So uh, there are things going on, but uh, I, certainly I, I would, you know, we do need to encourage our small businesses. Uh, with regard to the abuseness of, of zero hours contract, well, the, the one you described to us does sound like an abuse. Uh, it, it certainly, uh, if somebody is aware of that, they should go to the Jersey Advisory Conciliation Service and ask for support uh, to uh, get that resolved. They should be using perhaps another form of contract, a short-term contract as opposed to zero hours. Um, with regard to the code of conduct, of course, yes, ministers must uh, ab abide by that. I don't consider uh, myself uh, as a states member, as, being, as a career politician by any means. I'm just here to serve the community. Thank you, Paul. I call Jeff Haben. Ah, if I may, I'm going to do it in reverse order. Mr. Ludlam, um, should states ministers have a code of conduct and adhere to it? Absolutely quite right. There are remedies that can be used within the states and they should be used, but you are never going to get away from a good old personality clash. It happens everywhere, and that is something two people have to work out for themselves, I'm afraid. Um, zero time contracts, yes, there is abuse. Uh, in some cases, they work well. Uh, we know, but they know they're abused in some places. Remedies through jacks. Um, I'm old enough to remember when it was actually called piecework. Um, Alex Morrell, small businesses. Yes, we need to look at licensing in cases where skill sets are not available and, and relax that. Employment law needs to be re-looked at. A six-month cut-off for a full-time employee is not always long enough where you're cross-training them across probably four or five disciplines. Footfall in town is something we need to address. Um, that is probably looking at parking charges. And we're all competing with the, with the good old internet, maybe lowering the GST limit as well, so not so many people take advantage of it. There are many things, and it's lots of little things that need to be taken in, in consideration and, and put together. Thank you, Jeff. I call Sarah Ferguson. Right, 80% of our businesses are small businesses. Um, I believe that at the moment a state's department is visiting um, employers and offering to send an advisor to help business, businesses employing less than 10 people fill in forms. I, come on, this is ridiculous. There are 45 different forms when you're starting a business. Is this really a way to earn a living? Um, yes, we need education of the young, and I think we need another industrial park where small businesses, not retail businesses, can actually rent places at a reasonable rent. Um, zero hours contract, yes, I have been to see the minister with an employment lawyer to see what we can do to change this. I'm assured that um, they're actually working on it and it's, um, the employment panel are going out to consultation on it uh, on the next couple of months. Um, bank nurses, though, are a useful use of um, zero hours contracts. And I agree with Guy, politicians are accountable to you and your vote is your voice. So you can vote them out if you don't like them. Thank you, Sarah. I call Chris McGee. 
Thank you. Um, in relation to the first question, small businesses, um, in my manifesto I've outlined that I will never support raising GST. Uh, I want to remove it completely at every stage from organic produce which is grown in the island. And here in St Lawrence, I've read earlier today that there are, there are small farmers struggling to get by because of excessive taxation and there are other small businesses that are, that are doing the same. If I wanted to start a business tomorrow, before I've bought any stock, before I've even done anything, I owe about 12 grand a year. Why? Just because. And I, that money could be used to hire an apprentice, it could be used to reinvest, it could be used to do all sorts of other things. But, uh, but no, I think the current system is, is very unfair. I want to see the money that the, the self-employed are paying in the, storm, in the form of so-called contributions. Um, do states members, I think the question was not should states members follow their own code of conduct, but do states members follow their own code of conduct? And you just gave us some examples there, so the obvious, the obvious answer is no. Um, I think that the best, the best thing to do is to not vote for them again. And uh, in relation to zero-hour contracts, there is a lot of abuse going on, and I think the free market can solve that problem quicker than, quicker than the government will be able to. Name and shame, I think, is the best, best way to go. Um, there, there are potentially provisions coming out for the removal of exclusivity clauses in zero-hour contracts, which I would support if elected. Thank you. Thank you, Chris. Sean Dooley Power. Um, in relation to the first question, which was to do with small business, I think the states deliberately set up a series of roadblocks and obstacles to help to stop somebody setting up in business. And as Sarah has rightfully said, there are so many forms to fill in, it's unbelievable. The way to help set up or to allow small businesses to set up, to enable innovation and creativity, is to cut red tape, cut the cost of setting up, and let them get on with it. These are the wealth creators. In order to distribute wealth, somebody has to create it for us. These are the people that create the wealth. So we've got to do that. And also the problem is we police the people, the companies and the individuals self-employed who go to the population office. So when we make it hard for them, what happens then? Other people set up with the cash in hand and the grey economy so there's cause and effect. That's the problem. We need to make it easier. Um, zero hour contracts, some of it is justifiable, some of it is completely obscene. One of the examples you gave is the obscenity of what's going on in the last 18 months, not just in subcontracting with telephones, but in a whole other areas. We lost a very, very good planning officer recently who was on a zero hour contract for three years. We lost a really good guy. And finally, inefficiencies in the state system, I need three hours. Um, all I can say is that um, we have a litany of problems within the state system. There are ways of dealing with it, and sometimes I think politicians need more, politicians need more gonads to deal with some of it. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Sean. I call Andrew Green. Um, dealing with Mr. Adam's question first, uh, should we have a uh, a, a policy for ministers to work to in terms of our behaviour? Well, probably yes, but it's a shame that we need it. I have two very simple rules in my life that I've kept for the whole the, the time that I can remember. First of all, I treat people how I want to be treated. And secondly, in providing services, if it's not good enough for my mum, it's not good enough for anybody else's. And those have kept me in good stead for the whole of my working career. Now, zero hours contracts. They have a place in places like my industry, the hospitality industry, uh, for example, if there's a wedding on Saturday and you need another 30 members of staff just for that day, that's a legitimate use of zero hours. Anything else is an abuse, and what you described there, Mr Miller, should be illegal. It's certainly an abuse, and it should be stopped. What would I do to support small businesses? Well, I could rattle off a load of things that would be popular. The truth, the truth is, I think lots of small businesses, yes, a holiday on um, in, in, uh, social security would help, but I think lots of small businesses, if you get a, a plumber or electrician or a tradesman who's good at his job, he could do with some support with the business plan and the uh, accounts and that. So I'd like to see a place where they could go and get that sort of support as well. Thank you. Thank you, Andrew. I call Zoe Cameron. 
with regard to small businesses, I think in today's very complex world, a small group of politicians um, developing policy can't possibly know everything about all there is to know. And I think we need to get better at going to um, ask people on the front line, whether it's in health or small businesses, exactly what the difficulties are and understand that better. Um, and it, it requires a sort of light governance touch. I mean, like with, when it comes to um, inefficiencies, as well as with dealing with small um, businesses, I think we always need to keep our focus on values and ethics about what is going to serve the island and islanders best, rather than that particular organisation or the public service. With regard to um, zero hours contracts, it's come up an, an, a lot, and as a GP, I know how much stress people are put under, not knowing um, week to week what their wages is going to be and whether they can afford to pay their bills. Um, I think there needs to be a lot firmer, better guidance around it, and possibly looking at the employment law that made gave employment um, rights slightly too early, I think, and made zero hours contracts. Um, too, too readily used. Thank you. Thank you, Zoe. I call Alan McLean. Uh, thank you. And uh, Alex, thank you for your question. Um, small businesses are at the heart of the community and the heart of the economy. 81% of businesses in Jersey are local businesses employing six or less people. That was the reason that we set up Jersey Business. We've put a budget of £800,000 in there. It's a private sector organisation with entrepreneurs and professionals running it, giving advice to small businesses and set up businesses. It's absolutely critical. Um, we've got to be careful with legislation. The family friendly legislation that was introduced was the right thing to do, but there was no uh, economic impact assessment undertaken as to what the impact of small businesses would be and whether any exemptions were required. That was wrong. That's not good decision making. We need to look at the employment legislation, again for small businesses. 26 weeks unfair dismissal in Jersey. It's a year in Guernsey, two years in the UK. We're not competitive with our immediate um, jurisdictions and that's not good. Skills and training, we need to put more money into helping small businesses from a skills and training point of view. Zero hours contracts are abused and that needs to be stopped. They need to be monitored and we need to work out ways to stop it. But they do provide an important requirement in certain areas, like hospitality, for example, that's been mentioned. They provide flexibility, and a lot of employees actually like them. But it's about getting that balance right, which is important. Uh, ben, your question. It's absolutely essential that states members lead by example. We are representative, we're your representatives. And as I often say, the fish rots from the head down. If there are problems, we have to deal with them. Thank you, Alan. I call David Richardson. Uh, thank you. Um, I'll start with the last question first, codes of conduct. Yes, obviously everybody has to, um, in a position of the states, has to be as proper as possible. Uh, I think people used to be stupidly aggressive in the old days, and that seems to have gone. We tend to be more polite these days, and that must come down. Um, just, just as a point, when you talked about the termination point, uh, car, of the, the payments that were made, I do think they're eye-wateringly high, and these contracts should be negotiated, the termination could be negotiated before somebody's employed. Uh, that is a very major point that came out of that question. As a small business, yes, I've helped, have, um, uh, helped two uh, Polish people start, recently start up a business, and funny enough, the red tape was a lot, but it did actually help determine which one was going to be the survivor. One couldn't produce his accounts, it was totally messy, the other one was very neat. That one survived, the other one hasn't. I managed to keep the other one survived. So every business is different. Yes, we should encourage them with grants and all sorts of help, and certainly cut red tape where possible. Zero hours um, is a necessary evil. Um, it is greatly abused by certain people, but it's necessary because certain people really need to get back and work, and this is a one way of getting back into work. Abuse uh, could be stamped out, but, it can't, uh, but I don't think over-regulation um, over is the answer. I think guidelines are helpful, and the employment should inspect those people who abuse it. Thank you. Thank you, David. I call Philip Balash. 
Um, I agree with uh, everything that Senator McLean has said about small businesses, which are the lifeblood of the community. I think we do need to look at the question of whether there should be some modification of the restrictions contained in the employment law and in family-friendly legislation. Striking a fair balance between the rights of employees and the rights of uh, the employer uh, is difficult, but we ought to be prepared to look at it. Zero hours contracts have been raised at a number of the hustings and there does seem to be some evidence of abuse. The Social Security Department is carrying out a review and I look forward to uh, reading that report in due course. Um, the last question, if I may say so, seemed to be slightly slanted against the uh, Treasury Minister in the sense that all the examples given uh, were examples of decisions in which he had been closely involved. I don't want to go into the details of any of those cases, but sometimes officials, even high officials, go off the boil. And it then is in the public interest that they should retire and be replaced. These are very difficult decisions. And and uh, almost invariably, they are not taken by an individual minister, but by a group of ministers. Of course, I agree that uh, ministers should comply with the Code of Conduct. Thank you, Philip. I call Anne Southern. Yes, I have been invited to talk to James Filial on Monday about red tape. Uh, I don't think I'd agree to anything if it cut across workers' rights, uh, however much small businesses would like that. Um, I do think there should be more understanding when small businesses are asking for licences. They seem to be more strictly applied for small businesses than they do in, in larger industries where it seems to me that they're not policed at all. Um, I think there is scope for having a different rate of social security payment for a business that's starting up and scale it like it is in the UK. Uh, I believe there's a, 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 something called innovations that help small businesses, but I've heard that sometimes that they give funds to businesses that don't have a good business model and don't help the more successful ones, which doesn't seem right to me. Uh, zero hours contracts, well, Reform Jersey has a very clear policy on this. It was one of our sitting members that brought a proposition to the states to have a review of it. If a small business wants to employ somebody for a few hours a week and that's on top of their normal job, that's fine. If you're a supply teacher, that's fine. But it's abusive if it's your proper job. And people who don't get a certain number of hours in a week have to pay extra social security payments, which is absolutely iniquitous, and they can't get uh, sick pay from social security, let alone their employer. Um, the way to stop it, I think, is to give uh, social security the powers to police it. Sorry, I didn't get to yours. You made your point. <laughs> Thank you, Anne. I call Lyndon Farnham. <clears throat> Thank you. First, I think we need to um, get going on returning the policies that are going to bring the economy uh, back to growth, which will hope, help all um, uh, businesses. I'm particularly uh, keen to ensure that we use the um, innovation funding and the funding we have in place that we're not utilising properly, in my opinion, although we have got moving with it recently to um, help small business. I want to see a complete red tape review. There's been a lot of misinformation bandied around on the platform tonight <laughs> about tens of millions here and hundred millions there and 45 forms. They're not true. But there's no reason why with technology and the way we can spread and disseminate uh, information that we can't have one form for a business to fill in uh, when they're setting up. I remember when I started my first business, I had to go to Zero Market House, fill in a form, register my business name and off I went. I think it cost 50p and I probably complained about the price then as well, I would have thought. Um, uh, Mr Miller, it's a good question. I've got nothing new to add other than we need... We do need regulations to be specific in the use of zero hour contracts. I'm not going to um, uh, join in the sort of the criticism of the civil service that ten tends to be common at election time. I have a very cordial, I think I have a very cordial and productive re relationship with the officers um, I work with. I think our civil service are generally excellent and um, um, I think I said it was, a, a, and um, I've lost my train of thought, but I'm coming back to it bef before the, before the, but yes, it is not a strong um, uh, a civil servant you need to be worried about. It's a weak politician, which is why you must make sure you elect politicians who are capable of showing some leadership. Thank you. Thank 
you, Lyndon. I call Ian Gorst. Uh, thank you, Alex. Yes, the, as other speakers have said, small businesses are the lifeblood of our economy. Uh, but equally, I think this answer comes back to what uh, Nick just asked us a few moments ago. We've got to be realistic about what's achievable. And I, for one, don't think uh, that it's right that small businesses uh, should not have to uh, comply with family-friendly legislation. Of course they should. Those uh, workers should have the same rights. But there are areas where we can look at exemptions in the employment law, but they will have to be narrow and they will have to be carefully considered because we're talking about workers' rights. When I was Minister for Social Security, uh, I changed the rate for people starting up uh, new businesses for Social Security. They had to pay £500 a month and I reduced it down to £160 a month. Uh, perhaps we need to keep doing more. We need to keep looking at those barriers uh, and try to move them where we can. But as you know, Social Security and Jersey Business are doing a lot there. A zero hours contracts bill, of course, I am aware of uh, the concerns that you've raised. My department with Social Security is looking at it and I believe that we're going to be able to find some mechanism. Coming back to Ben's question, that was an extremely complex uh, report. There were lots of complex issues. Of course, the current Control and Auditor General has said that actually the Minister was right to ask some of those questions uh, because the questions hadn't been appropriately asked. Uh, ministers have to hold officials to account. Again, I think that's what uh, Nick's question was about. And that's what you're electing us to do. And sometimes the outcome of holding to account will be unpleasant. There is already a ministerial code. Thank you. Thank you, Ian. And our final speaker this evening, Philip Ozef. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, first of all, small business all said it's the life of uh, blood of the economy. The Jerseyman and Jersey woman is that it's at their heart an entrepreneur. And we need to create the right environment uh, where people can set up, grow, uh, and carry on growing uh, their businesses. Uh, that means uh, low uh, red tape. Uh, that means uh, regulation that actually works. Uh, I've, um, those GVA figures show that it's going to be small businesses that are going to power ourselves um, out of um, the recovery. Uh, Cyril Lamarcon mentioned earlier uh, said the name of the game is confidence and confidence comes when you've got strong public finances and you've got ministers that are clear about what they're trying to do and particularly financial services are a great future and particularly small fintech uh, businesses. Uh, we also need an equivalent to the Jersey, uh, the British Business Bank uh, adding on what Alan's done in terms of the innovation fund. Uh, Mr uh, Miller, zero hour contracts I agree with the abusers. Uh, they do allow people to get employed. Um, is that me done? No. no, no. no? Okay, 30 seconds. Mr. Ludnam, at always, at once, I act in the public interest. And some of the decisions that I've been called to make are difficult. Sometimes, as a minister, you have to stand up to the strong, if I may say. And you have to stand up to strong civil servants. And I have done so, always, with your public interest at its heart. There's a lot of misinformation. Look at that Control and General report, the new excellent Control and Auditor General report, said I was right on every single count that I did in terms of that issue which you raised. And I regret the fact that it's now being used again to cast aspersions on me. Read the report, please, sir. Thank you very much indeed. I'll try and continue.